It is indeed a great pleasure and honor to welcome Dr. Anton Armstrong to the United Church of Santa Fe in worship this morning. And also it is indeed a pleasure and an honor to welcome Brad Ellenbow <laughs> in worship this morning. Brad has been a part of the staff here at United since 2015 and has brought a whole new level of choral singing and congregational singing to our choir and to the whole congregation. He also puts up with me, and <laughs> that is no small feat. And also, uh, the diversity of mu this congregation has always sung a diversity of music uh, because we believe that singing God's song in different cultures and different languages reminds us that God is more bilingual than any of us. And also, reminds, when you sing somebody else's song, then you also begin to understand, we begin to understand their souls as well. And so we've been singing a lot of, lot of songs this morning. And today uh, we're engaging in a trilogue sermon. Actually, it's a Q&R sermon, as uh, Anton pointed out. It's not a question and answer. I ask a couple questions and they respond. They can say whatever they want to say. It may we, or may we, not answer. We may or may not answer. I uh, know, they may or may not answer. I'm going to move this out of the way uh, so sure. we can get that. And, <laughs> and also, I should have a little podium here, but <laughs> since I'm, I'm a foot shorter than either one of them. I, is, is that a requirement of St. Olaf College that you be a certain height, yeah. six foot five or whatever? Yeah, right. Okay. So, um, Brad, how about you and Anton sharing how it is you two know each other? Just the good parts. No, just the or good parts. the parts you can tell in church. Yeah. A long story. Uh, it started years ago. We sang together in the St. Olaf Choir to do this. Yeah. I'm two years older than him, but he stood behind me and harassed me during that year we sang together. <laughs> so things Some things like never that. change. Some things never change, right. And here, almost 50 years later, we still do that. Yeah, um, Yeah. Anton was uh, two years ahead of Karen and I, and uh, we uh, became friends uh, uh, early on in my sophomore year. I was in the choir and Anton was a senior. And as a matter of fact, just a little shout out, today's prelude was uh, arranged by John Helgen, who was in between us in age. So it's a St. Olaf uh, morning today. Um, yes, and then, of course, we went into essentially the same line of work. I did a lot of solo singing in, earlier in my career, and Anton was great to hire me many times and bring me along on tours and so forth, and we've, we've been dear friends since... 1977, I guess. 76. Man, you guys 76. Are yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's right. You heard it here first. That's right. yeah. um, not everybody, because this isn't a Lutheran congregation. Mm -hmm. um, we don't. Not everybody necessarily would know St. Olaf College. Why? Why did the two of you happen to cross paths there and, and speak, become such great musicians? It's a bit more natural for him because he's of Norwegian heritage and lineage. I grew up I Lutheran. never knew that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Wait, you're not Norwegian? <laughs> no, 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 no. But you know this, I've told you this before. My great grandmother was a Dane, was Danish. Oh. So we could be kissing cousins. There we are. Like, we like the Danes. Denmark <laughs> controlled Norway for many years I know. before the Swedes okay, okay, controlled. Okay, okay. <laughs> and you've been bossing me around since 76. That's right. <laughs> It wasn't until I went to seminary, when I came from Arizona to go to Connecticut for school, I thought I knew ethnicity, because I am growing up in a multicultural place in, in Arizona. But it wasn't until I got to seminary, supposedly an interfaith seminary, Yale Divinity School, that I realized that there was another ethnic whole configuration I never had known, which was Lutheran. Because to me, they all looked the same, but I realized for the first time there that if a Swede Lutheran and a Norwegian Lutheran married, it was considered a mixed marriage. <laughs> to, hey, we're not kidding. And actually. it still is, probably. Right. Yeah. Uh, and to answer your question sincerely, uh, to Anton's point, it is a Norwegian American, oh, was founded by Norwegians uh, who wanted their young people to um, integrate into the country and uh, uh, it was, uh, Norway is a Lutheran country, and the uh, college, and Anton can speak more to this, remains uh, Lutheran in background, and as it's risen in national prominence, that is a hard row to hoe. A lot of places that started, Harvard and Yale, both started as Congregationalist schools, but then uh, as they became more uh, ethnically diverse, they let go of some of that. Anyhow, um, my brothers went there, I had grandparents that went there, and so forth. It is an undergraduate college. Karen went there in nursing. Um, Larry and Nyla Rasmussen 
went there. Uh, you're, it's you know a wide variety of majors, but it has a very famous choral tradition that Anton is now the fourth conductor of the St. Olaf Choir in its 112 year history. So how did, how, uh, Anton, yeah. how did you yeah. get from I want to say one thing about St. Olaf, where it's been distinctive since its origins. Most church colleges at that time, certainly all the Lutheran colleges, educated only men for, for careers as ministers or teachers. St. Olaf, from its inception, wanted their daughters to also be educated in this new world. And we next year will celebrate our sesquicentennial, our 150th anniversary of founding. Uh, I feel really ancient because my first year as a student was the centennial. <laughs> so, That's great. Yeah, so you, I'm marking these points of demarcation. Yeah, Lutheranism in the 21st century is not an exclusive uh, uh, way of thinking. It is quite ecumenical in our college mm -hmm. ministry staff now. Absolutely. We not only have two ordained ELCA pastors, but you also have a spiritual chaplain for our Jewish students and one for our Muslim students. Mm -hmm. So it seeks that type of thing. And while, yes, we are a very proud um, college, liberal arts college, in still a very traditional way, grounded uh, in a very global perspective, we send the most students of any undergraduate school in the nation of our students who go on to study mm -hmm. abroad, but we are still founded as a community of faith. Mm -hmm. and that. As the college has grown more diverse, not only ethnically, but also as the college has grown more diverse in its view of faith, it creates a healthy tension. Um, every once in a while I get colleagues who say, why do we have to pray before faculty meetings or we do these things? Because we are a community of faith, but there are many different perspectives. I grew up in New York. I grew up in a Lutheran country. There are black Lutherans. <laughs> most people, I was saying this last night at dinner, most people think that the oldest um, Lutheran settlements were either in Virginia or Pennsylvania. Not. They were in what we now call the U.S. Virgin Islands because those were Danish islands until 1917, so the state church. My, uh, quick, and now I'll get back to your questions. <laughs> My mother grew up Seventh-day Adventist. Um, my dad came to this country from the British West Indies when he was 18. My mother was born in the States. Her family went back to live in, in St. Thomas, and then she spent her teen, teenage years in New York and Harlem. Sabbath for the Seventh-day Adventists, like our Jewish brethren, Friday sundown to Saturday sundown. But when my grandparents, my mother was at Sabbath school, she was actually dancing in the clubs in Harlem, at which point um, my grandparents said, you will have God in your life if you live in this house. She was 17. My mother was always one, if you put an obstacle in her way, if she couldn't go through it, she found a way around it. And we had one aunt and uncle who were Lutheran. They were married in that oldest church, Lutheran church in the Western Hemisphere. And she said, I'll have God in my life. I'll dance Saturday night. I'll go to the Sunday church. That's how I got to be a Lutheran. Okay? God works in mysterious yep. ways, yep. right? That's great. That's great. So the, the scripture passage we heard this morning talks about Jesus and the disciples singing. And they would have sung throughout their whole lives. They, they would have sung the 150 psalms, which are songs. They might have sung folk songs. So they might have, and, and even at the very end of his life, Jesus on the cross quoted a psalm, a song. My Lord, my Lord, why have you forgotten me? Why have you abandoned me? So even though we think of you know, Jesus as healer, Jesus as uh, rabbi, Jesus as teacher, Jesus as miracle worker, Jesus as the holy one, Jesus is singer. Jesus is singer. So for, for both of you, because you're both people of deep faith, and you're also these incredible musicians who help the rest of us find our voices. Anton, what, what shaped you as a young person to become the choral director that you are now? My church. Okay. When I was a rambunctious six-year-old, not sitting still in Sunday school class, there were several of us who were like that. And the people who were heads of, uh, directors of worship, uh, music for the church, um, Carol Weber saw that. Her son was my same age, and she knew how bad we could behave. So she <laughs> talked to the Sunday school superintendent, and she said, keep them for a half an hour, and then give them to me at a point when they're usually acting up, and I'll take them to the choir. You know, you'll see most children's choirs, usually two-thirds girls and third boys. We had more boys in that junior choir, okay? <laughs> but that's where she didn't uh, want us, she wanted us to be worship leaders. 
I can still sing you the first solo I ever sang. Thou didst leave thy throne and thy kingly crown when thou camest to earth for me. But in Bethlehem's home was there found no room for thy holy nativity. Oh, come to my heart, Lord Jesus, there's room in my heart for thee. That church on its inscription on its education building, train up a child in the way in which he shall go, and when he is old, he shall not depart from it. It was in that church junior choir. I went to parochial day school, they had great teachers, but I learned my faith because I sang mm -hmm. my faith. Mm -hmm. Jesus understood that and having that hymn at the end Absolutely. of the Lord's Supper. Right, and, and I know that sometimes, at least I can sing things I can't say, or at least that I, I don't always necessarily believe fully, like in Sweet Sweet Spirit that we just sang, it talks about following Jesus all the way. Well, I don't know about you guys, I don't do that on a regular <laughs> basis, uh, but I can sing it, and maybe it gets me back on track. Brad, how about you? What uh, the role of music in your, the role of singing in your faith? Um, well, you know, it, it's almost indivisible. I mean, it's uh, it's the way I worship. Um, and and one of the things, and Anton spoke of this yesterday in his talk to the festival choir, is um, the fact that now in the 20th and 21st century, people uh, don't sing as much as they used to. I think I see a lot of people my age nodding their heads, remembering we'd gather around the piano at grandma's house or some such thing. And now we all have these individual things we can listen to and earbuds or wonderful, you know, hey, Alexa, play, Leonard Bernstein, play, Stevie Wonder, play anything. But uh, we leave it to the professionals. And one of the things I love about this church is we really do sing. In fact, my brothers listen online and they talk about that. And, and, and my father, my mother sang very well. My father uh, had good pitch, but kind of poor rhythm. So she'd always be like, come on, come on, come on. Um, but one of the things that, I could see your mother doing that. Yeah, he knew, he knew my mother. And, um, uh, but my dad believed, and he was, he was born in 1917. He only went to the eighth grade. He did not come from an elite background. But he said, well, the point is that these words, we need to say these words out loud together. And, um, and so I think a lot of people feel like, well, I can't really sing, so I'll just stand here and kind of look around and watch other people sing and so forth. I, I always had to give it to my dad who, uh, who would say, yeah, but if we stand up and we say, uh, our creator who art in heaven, I'm going to say that. While it's the time of the hymn, I should be saying this too. Maybe a little slower than other people, <laughs> but he, by golly, he did it. So Anton, as you teach students, I mean, and you've, you've been teaching now at St. Olaf for, well, you've been a professor your entire life, yeah. or your entire academic life, yeah. right? And so what do you, I mean, I'm sure, you, I know you've seen lots of changes, but with the current class of students that you're working with, how, what do you hope happens in teaching them? Yeah, the because from the time, very different when we were students there, and most kids had gone to church, whether or not they stayed in church when they left. More and more of the students we have, even a, a wonderful place like St. Olaf, don't come from uh, mm -hmm. families that, that were in faith communities. Some, they don't quite say agnostic or atheist, but they'll say mm -hmm. nuns, mm -hmm. N-O-N-E-S. Mm -hmm. Right, a little bit different. <laughs> yeah, and, and so what I need to do, and instill the majority of the literature I do with the St. Olaf Choir, 90% of it is sacred in nature. Mm -hmm. I need to tr figure out, and this has been the challenge, how do I make it relevant to their lives? Mm -hmm. The joy of my, my position is that I just came from a two-week tour on the road on a bus with 70 wonderful singers, but through the Southeast <coughs> United States. And several of the pieces, because I knew I was going to the Bible Belt, so I programmed pieces that were based on hymns. Mm -hmm. One being, Come You Disconsolate, which when mm -hmm. I asked how many had sung out of 70 voice choir, I had five kids raise their hands. When I surveyed the wondrous cross, I had eight kids raise their hands. Wow. By the end of that tour, they knew that, and especially in the setting that we did, it was a very powerful setting. They could see how it impacted the audience, mm -hmm. and not just people you know, who were born before 1970, how young people could be impacted. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so if you can make it relative and, and relevant to them, I have students saying, I don't want to sing music by these dead white men anymore. But if I do a Bach motet, Fjotte dich nicht, 
based on Isaiah, be not afraid, I am with thee. I strengthen thee, I uphold thee. And when I say to them, don't you want somebody at your back? <laughs> don't you want somebody? That's what this is about. Will they, will they admit they will believe in a God? But you plant a seed, mm -hmm. and then I get the letters or the emails, especially when they start having children, and they start seeing the values they need to, and mm -hmm. all of a sudden they start thinking of these hymns. There are, I'm not trying to hock the wear, but you'll see some albums out there, and if you want to buy them, they'll sell them to you today. But they're great hymns of faith, and I was doing that 25 years ago. Mm -hmm. And I still remember this dear Alto leaving the room saying, why do we sing these daggone old freaking hymns? Alto? And Alto said that? And Alto said that. <laughs> oh, my goodness. But I also <laughs> had two members of the choir um, battling cancer. Mm -hmm. One to this day is still alive and producing great music, Abby Bettinas. Oh, yeah. The other one was taken home. Mm -hmm. And the day that we had to record the first album, we were singing at her memorial service. Mm -hmm. And the hymn she was complaining about that day was Abide With Me. Mm -hmm. Fast fall the evening tide. But Hold yeah. thou thy cross before thy closing eye. Where is death sting where grave thy victory? I triumph still if thou abide with me. That same child who I was about to kill, literally. My New York side hasn't left me, right? I'm going to go after and chop that child off at her knees. She came up to me after the service and she said, <laughs> the verb, thank you for making us sing these hymns. Mm. I understand it today. You plant seeds and Absolutely. they will grow later. Absolutely. I heard an anecdote once, I don't know if it's apocryphal, but there was a rabbi who was... This is not going to be an Ole Lena joke, is it? No. Okay, good. Right. <laughs> Although I have those. Um, the, a rabbi was working in this country, but had, uh, you know, emigrated from the old country, and his English was a little bit um, not always perfect. And he said once, we need to teach the children uh, the songs of the faith so that they can be on their hearts. And somebody said, Rabbi, don't you mean in their hearts? And he said, no, I mean on their hearts. And then someday when their heart breaks, they'll, the words will fall in when they need them. <laughs> so I, I was going to ask you guys, what would Jesus sing? But I'm not going to ask that question. Good, good. <laughs> but what is one hymn or even a line from a hymn that comes back to you in, when that, in, the, in the heart break, broken times or in the really good times or that has stayed with you? Well, I mentioned this yesterday. Mm -hmm. When dementia took my mother away mm -hmm. from her loved ones, and when medical science couldn't bring my mother back to us, mm -hmm. it was the hymns that she taught and sang to us. Mm -hmm. His eyes on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. Mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. His eyes on the sparrow. And always know, what I try to tell these, these folks and a lot of them, you know, they, they may not totally buy into it, and that's fine. But I said, one of the readings of the Psalms, I, we had a professor, Gordy, who would say, God, we turn away from God, but God never turns away from us. Mm -hmm. And for them to understand that whether or not you're ready to see God, now God is always there. And at a time, I love that, I'm going to remember that, and I'll give you credit for that story. But you don't, they, you don't know mm -hmm. when, they don't know when they will need these songs. Mm -hmm. and, and that one was one my mother sang to me. And she'd make me sing with her. Sometimes I didn't want to sing with her. But I'm so grateful to have that song because that was a song that brought me back. And for the last I could see her, uh, that medicine, no, it was that hymn. And that was God's way of bringing us back together. Because you said in the story that you shared yesterday with the choir that you'd gone to see your mother, and for the first several hours of the conversation, she didn't even know. She, there, was there was no conversation. There was no conversation. But then when you started to sing the hymn, yeah. then it's like, it's like the veil lifted. Lifted, and yeah. she recognized yeah. who you were, and yeah. you spent the rest of the day yeah. singing. Yep. Yeah. That's a powerful witness to a, the yeah. power of it. That's a powerful witness to a powerful hymn. Yeah. Brad, how and much? And for me, well. The answer is, Jesus loves me, and the, uh, it's as simple as it can be, but it reminds me of, of something that, and again, it's not going to be a joke, but hopefully a bit of wisdom. Garrison Keillor <laughs> wrote an article once, or it was a speech that he gave yeah. at the World Conference in Minneapolis, and he said, um, singing in choirs is like storytelling, yeah. and it, we are ambitious, and if you're a storyteller, 
like Keeler is, we want to do literature and we want to make it complicated and we want to show off to our peers that we know all of these tricks of the trade. But really, storytelling and choral singing is really about touching the heart. And he, and he says, and, and I think ideally making people cry. <laughs> and, uh, and so if it sounds like, boy, that was really hard, you really worked hard on that, then we've sort of lost the battle. I think it, even if it's complex, if we're not actually talking to you, but Jesus loves me, um, puts that all aside. Can I jump in on something? Yeah, of course. So my father passed before my mother, and I was left to, to, to plan the service. I knew some of the things she wanted. And dad died very unexpected and very suddenly, and I was at the Oregon Bach Festival conducting. So I was trying to do this long distance, and I read her I, the passages as she wanted, the hymns. She said, you, you've left one out. And my mother would like to play with me every once in a while. She said, you may have that doctorate, but sometimes in the school of common sense, you flunk big time, boy. And, um, <laughs> I think we all three of us had the same mother. Yeah, yeah OK. <laughs> but she went on and finally said, Ma, just tell me what you want. Now, when she went, because her clue, which I still didn't get, what would every child in the West Indies, what hymn would tell them about, about the saving grace of God? It's Jesus loves me. Yeah. Boils it down to a test. Yep. Indeed. I think rather than continuing to talk, why don't we hear some singing? Sure. sure. One of the songs you're, that song you're going to be sharing is Amazing Grace. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Amen. Thank you. You're Amen. Welcome.